Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. This is going to be a, um, an exciting, exciting evening, I think. We're looking at several uh, architecture and design journals, some older, some newer. Um, I'm going to give just, a, I'm just going to have a few comments to situate this a little bit in history. Um, very, very brief. Then uh, each of our speakers will will come up, talk about his or her affiliation to journal or magazine very briefly, and then we'll have a, a sort of panel, sort of a conversation, and then a discussion in the room. Um, I just wanted to say, again, put this in a little bit of history. Uh, oppositions, and I brought oppositions because I'm sure none of, I'm the only one here I'm sure that actually has copies, no? Um, um, started in 1973 ended in uh, 1984. It was, for my generation, the definition of uh, contemporary journal of architecture and, and, and theory. It itself was modeled on modernist avant-garde, so-called little magazines, very much was the model, very self-conscious about that model. Um, I was just looking at authors as I was, was thinking about this. Almost every one of the authors in opposition um, high percentage of practicing architects or pra trained architects who had become scholars, like someone like Frampton or, or Alan Cahoon, people who had actually practiced but had ended up in academia. That'll be very interesting to think about the authors. It was almost, um, almost across the board. Um, oppositions was at a time when the discourse was very much, very much turning in on itself. There was a high degree of, of formal analysis, and, and I mean that in the best way. Um, there's, there was a very, there was a self-consciousness about constructing a, a discursive frame for architecture as such. It was very internalized, very formal, very structuralist, I would, I would say. Um, it ended in 1984. The journal that claimed to uh, not, not, not so much fill this place as follow it, as assemblage, uh, began in 1986, so there was that two-year hiatus. It's interesting, they were both published by MIT Press, uh, uh, toward, uh, at least at the beginning, um, so, sorry, uh, it, it, at some point in their, in their um, life, um, uh, and one sort of followed the other. Uh, assemblage ended in uh, the year 2000. The authors of Assemblage were a generation that were among the very first, who most of whom had trained as architects and had then gotten PhDs. It was an unusual uh, combination at that time. Later, there were people from outside the field, but most, which is say most were scholars and not practicing architects. Um, Jeff Kipnis uh, joked that the only, the only way, if, to get published in assemblage, if if you did not footnote either Jacques Derrida or Walter Benjamin, you couldn't, you would never get published. So it was very uh, tendentious, I suppose, in that sense. It tried to shift from a linguistics, structuralist, sort of semiotics-based problematic that was dominant in oppositions to explore affinities with cultural criticism, with, with post-structural theory, of course. Um, but mainly constructions of subjectivity, including uh, gendered subjectivity, issues of power and p property. The word geopolitics was emerging at the time. So it tried to, while, while uh, oppositions turned inward and tried to look at the sort of interior of architecture, I think assemblage was exploring exteriority, uh, but still very much in architectural terms. Um, one could argue that by 2000, theory as such had already started to wane. I didn't know this. I, I think I'm, I, I don't have like the best search machine, but I, but I did find, I think the word post-critical actually first appeared in assemblage, and it was a good enough reason to end it. Um, but, right? Because, um, and, and it seemed like theory was beginning to wane. Uh, Any started early, 1993, after oppositions, but it also ended in 2000. Uh, Any and assemblage ended the same year. I actually didn't know that. 
any also seemed to me a little bit like a end of the line project. Not, that, that's not a bad thing. It, it, was, it had very good review monographic issues. Tafuri, Johnson, Buckminster Fuller, Colin Rowe, James Sterling. They, they were amazing monographic issues, but the thematic issues, diagram was a good one, but digital, white form, um, kind of the thematic uh, issues of, of any felt, it, it, it felt like it didn't, there, there wasn't a clear tendency or direction. And then I'm not gonna go through the others log and um, well, well Zone you could argue was a book series rather than a journal. Very important, but let's say it was a book series. Um, log is still with us, so I'm not gonna, it started in 2003. Um, but Grey Room is interesting, and I'll end with this. It started in 2000, the year that any and Assemblage ended. It was very self-conscious, the, the next magazine. I remember that very, very well, that Felicity and Ryan Holden and others uh, thought of, of it as being the next in that line of MIT uh, published journals. Um, I, just a quick look at the way they advertise. Not a single architect or a scholar of architecture was mentioned as examples of authors. It, they, do have, they do have them, but they don't seem particularly proud, proud of them. So I'm just in terms of the authors, it's very interesting. Uh, the Grey Room represents, I suppose, a total shift away from disciplinary concerns toward concerns of, of media. Um, and even though it's a journal of architecture and media, it seems that it, it's really a journal of, of media. I would also say maybe, and this is something maybe we can explain more in discussion, a shift from a symptomatic reading of trying to understand architecture as having a kind of, uh, a, a kind of social, uh, yeah, a kind of social, but I would say historical power uh, that is not inert and not just determined by the situation, but that it's active in the situation to a different kind of reading that I would say a shift from symptomatic to suspicious. There's a high degree of very critical writing that kind of makes, uh, uh, is always indicting, it seems to me, rather than always enabling. That's where, that's where we are as I see it. I don't pretend that that's uh, too objective. But, but tonight we'll look at current magazines who, um, and already the diverse, I mean, I've left out a lot of uh, uh, magazines from other, uh, focused on the states, but, but even the diversity that we, ha we have represented here tonight is already an indication of a very different um, scene. I'm gonna introduce the editors very, very quickly, and then they'll come in the order that I introduce them uh, to make their presentations. Uh, James Graham of Avery Review. James uh, is director also of the publications at Columbia University's uh, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, um, and it, where he also teaches, uh, teaches there and edits the um, very important series, Columbia's uh, books on architecture in the city. He's currently completing a doctoral dissert dissertation um, it includes applied uh, psychology and issues of architectural pedagogy um, in, the, er, uh, in the 20th century before World War II. Um, he's the founding editor of Avery Review. Um, it's, it's, and Avery is unique, I think. It's not the only uh, journal that, tonight that has a digital presence, but it's the only journal whose primary presence is digital. Um, so, so, we, so that'll be one issue we talk about. Jennifer Sigler, of course, everyone in this room knows her of Harvard Design Magazine, where she's also editor-in-chief of publications uh, uh, at, at Harvard, at the uh, GSD. Well, you may not know, prior to joining the GSD, Jennifer was in the Netherlands, and she worked on a lot of interesting projects. I, I can't name them all, but one included uh, the Kohlhaas and Bruce Mao publication, SML. Excel uh, by Monicelli. She later joined the Berlaga Institute um, and, and was, where she was part of a, a sort of postgraduate laboratory for architecture. And there she started the publication Hunch um, and oversaw its first six issues. Does Hunch keep going now? No. We'll see. Okay. Um, 
Um, Ashley Schaefer, um, also a friend uh, of the school and uh, uh, used to teach here, is co-founder and, and co-editor of, of Praxis. Um, it, it describes itself as a journal of writing and building. Uh, and of course, the name Praxis also should should say a lot. It was um, uh, Ashley is also was the co-commissioner and and uh, co-curator. <laughs> of the U.S. Pavilion at not the latest Biennale, but the one just before the 14th uh, Venice Biennale. She's a professor of architecture at Ohio State. Um, um, yeah. Um, sorry, Kristen, <laughs> sorry. Kristen Geertz, your uh, bio was eaten by my printer. Um, so <laughs> remind, remind, remind me. Uh, tra trained in Belgium, uh, worked for Max One uh, in, in, in the beginning a while ago, and then and then and then founded uh, uh, with uh, worked for Neudling's uh, Rydic, um and and other places. Sorry, I'm sorry, I just didn't have all the links. But I do know he's uh, founding editor. Uh, of San Rocco magazine, along with uh, Andrea Zanderigo, who studied architecture in Venice at the Institute of Ar uh, Urbanism and Architecture. Um, he's taught many places, often together with, uh, with Kirsten, um, and he was co-founder in 2010 of the magazine San Rocco. So, so um, we'll start our presentations now and then have the conversation. Ah, uh, James, Tom. <laughs> I, I am so sorry. Thomas Weaver um, is the editor of the AA Files. AA Files, along with Harvard Design Magazine, is one of the oldest and continuous institutionally supported magazines. And I have no idea when Tom started or, or when. <laughs> I'm very sorry. And your first. No, no, yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was great. Um, so, first off, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's it's really actually an incredible and maybe slightly petrifying honor to be on a panel with uh, so many people who I consider um, editorial role models here. So I actually took the prompt very seriously, which was the question of what is content? And so maybe the thing I'd like to say about content is that it strikes me as a kind of uh, nested term. It refers to the things uh, that we produce for mediatic consumption, uh, those things being words, images, uh, et cetera. And maybe this is the more sort of 21st century version of the word, uh, especially as the world of digital media ushers in the rise of this new character who we might call the content uh, producer. So this version would have something to do with the kind of object quality of discourse. Um, but the other sense of, of content, uh, sort of like the, the contents uh, of a box, I suppose, has more to do with what's in there, um, obviously, the ideas and the buildings and the footnotes and the sort of sense of authorship um, that come bundled together within a given uh, text. And so this is really where our uh, editorial work, I think, intervenes. Uh, the project I'm going to show tonight, um, the Avery Review, was really started out of a sense of um, frustration with uh, the sort of current online discourse in architecture. The major websites, and these are the ones that I think you visit often, uh, are oriented toward the self-promotional, uh, the image-based, and often the uncomplicated. And this is, I think, in marked contrast to many other uh, fields for which the web has become a, a space of lively and experimental uh, writing and debate. Just in literature alone, you get things like the Los Angeles Review of Books, Public Books, The New Inquiry, and Plus One, just to name um, a couple. So if our most ubiquitous sites of architectural media sometimes add certain critical features and editorials, um, I, I would argue that maybe those are a sort of uh, compensation that in a way legitimates the larger sort of promotional um, enterprise. This would be perhaps content production uh, par excellence. And I realize that I, I run the risk of sounding a bit reactionary or, or maybe sort of sniffy about this, but I'm saying it because I think online discourse is so incredibly important uh, for the field and necessary for schools of architecture to be thinking about not as promotional tools or, or as a kind of outreach 
uh, but rather as a sort of fundamental means of creating publics around architectural ideas. That is ostensibly what uh, publications are meant to do. Uh, Walter Benjamin was writing about, so the, this is my, uh, the, the obligatory Benjamin citation, we'll get to uh, Deleuze, et cetera, later. He was writing about the newspaper when he argued that the, uh, uh, this scene of the limitless debasement of the word, I love that, is in fact where its salvation is being prepared. To the uh, contemporary ear, that sounds uh, awfully like the internet. And the point for me is that amidst all the sort of impatience that accompanies uh, our experience of the medium of digital reading, uh, that one can still find pockets of thoughtfulness, slowness, and maybe even a kind of genuine political thought. And there are a few sites that I think really do this. Um, but so the Avery Review um, is a digital journal of critical essays on architecture. We publish monthly during the academic year. Um, we like to mix uh, students, practitioners, faculty, historians, scholars, so send us your stuff. We're an editorial collaborative. Uh, this group of folks works uh, very intensely as a team. And our rules are quite simple. We ask our authors to engage with the work of others. We don't publish projects, we don't publish interviews, we don't publish historical research, per se. We publish essays in which authors sort of test out uh, their own commitments um, by filtering them through the act of looking carefully at somebody else's uh, work. And this is just one example. This is from our, uh, our recent um, October issue. So, I'm always sort of fond of returning to my man Montaigne and the moment of the essay's invention. We like very much the terms uh, origins in a verb rather than a noun, the old French essayer, uh, to try your hand at something. And this is what positions the essay as a sort of fundamentally exploratory and uncertain model of writing as a kind of active engagement without a predetermined um, end attached. It is an attempt, first and foremost. And so we're interested in sort of troubling some of the disciplinary expectations or areas of expertise that come with professions like architect and historian. Um, as an editor, uh, one of the privileges of being an editor is that you're very rarely uh, an expert. And I think as an essayist, uh, you're also often not wearing the hat of the expert um, exactly. And this, I think, is what allows us to think deeply on objects that don't necessarily sit squarely within our purview of knowledge. I think this is an obligation for, for architects. I'm interested in a, a, the embrace of a sort of sense of amateurism uh, in, in the sense that to be an amateur is to be a lover uh, with, with a taste for something. So Montaigne invents the essay in 1580. I'm not going to read you this passage from his preface to the reader. Uh, but what interests me really is that his idea of the essay is, is in its sort of mode of address, which asks for a kind of commonality over uh, sort of performance of erudition and the admission of the sort of incomplete search uh, to understand ideas. This is what makes it a, a central part of the sort of enlightenment project. And I do also want to sort of quickly point to the, the, the relationship between the essay form and 19th, 20th century modernism. Uh, and this is in architecture and otherwise. What happens in this period um, is that the essay becomes not just a sort of critical text, but a way of engaging the world. Uh, it takes on a newly political bearing, uh, particularly as it gets theorized by thinkers like Nietzsche, Lukács, Adorno, um, Benjamin, all of whom have written um, essays on, on essays. And this is something that um, Tom has thought and spoken about much more eloquently than, than I will do here. Um, well, let me just give you a passage from uh, Robert Musil's uh, The Man Without Qualities, which was written across several decades of interwar Europe. And actually, here's from my sort of dissertation uh, zone starts creeping into editorial practice. Uh, Musil's protagonist here, Ulrich, is propounding on the sort of virtues of what he calls essayism. Uh, and he's thinking about how he might even live his life like an actual essay. So it was more or less in the way an essay, in the sequence of paragraphs, explores a thing from many sides without wholly encompassing it. For a thing wholly encompassed suddenly loses its scope and melts down to a concept that he believed that he could most rightly survey and handle the world and his own life. So this sentence, it, it really sticks with me. Uh, it points to something important about the genre of writing we're interested in, which is the sense of multiple approaches or of seeing something or trying to apprehend something too complex to describe it uh, by coming at it from a range of discursive angles, each of which uh, is sort of necessarily incomplete. So to return to the question of what constitutes uh, content uh, for the Avery Review, 
it's not that we're interested in sort of recuperating the politics of you know, early 20th century European modernity or even kind of reclaiming the sort of individualistic sense of voice that you get with someone like Montaigne. But for us, really, the content of an essay is found in those angles of approach. Uh, the contents are the sort of discursive strands that uh, get gathered together and brought to bear on a particular um, object of inquiry. So at the risk of changing gears really rapidly, I wanted to say a couple of really quick things about the recent book that we published um, on the topic of climate change, uh, because I think it helps sort of show how this particular approach kind of plays out as an editorial uh, practice. Our book on climates comes from the feeling that the architectural response to climate change um, at the moment is, is still primarily framed through uh, sort of newly formed bodies of expertise. Uh, these forms of expertise go by names like resiliency, sustainability, uh, adaptation, mitigation, and so on. And to be clear, this is obviously like super important. And as a human being on the planet, I'm really glad that uh, good people are working on this. But our, our question was really a sort of different one, which is um, what happens when you look at climate essayistically? Um, after all, you know, since Vitruvius, architecture has always had a kind of climatic imagination attached to it. Things like climates, economies, and cultures are fundamentally co-produced. Climate isn't just this sort of externality um, out there that affects our lives from without. Climate is always suffused with politics of all kinds, uh, which are always a part of architecture, whether we uh, sort of admit it or not. So I'm going to just really quickly page through a few of the sort of themes that uh, we looked at. The first was to think about planetarity in architecture. That is the idea that there's no such thing as a sort of singular factual Earth, but only ways of understanding um, the Earth. We were looking at uh, 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 political ecology, which of course refers to the idea that environments and political economy can't be thought separately, that the way we sort of conceptualize uh, 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 the climate as a form of resource um, uh, in the end feeds back into how we uh, regard it and treat it. As you can tell, we love pluralizing things that aren't plurals. Uh, we were looking at corporealities, which of course is the idea that our physical bodies have everything to do with how we register the effects of our environment. This is actually the, a piece by Philippe Rahm that Chantel uh, beautifully translated uh, for us. And then finally, we were looking at uh, the idea of enclosure. Enclosure is of course a sort of territorial term. You think enclosure of the commons. Uh, but it can also be seen as a sort of political or economic interiority as well. But it, uh, it, it really um, is that for us the sort of most elemental act of architecture, which is to sort of partition and condition air, um, uh, is the moment where the sort of architectural envelope becomes this uh, point of interface between uh, our discipline um, and climate at large. And so I think that this sort of illustrates some of the ways that uh, the way we try to think about the work of the journal can uh, feed back into how we're regarding urgent topics for architecture. After finishing the book, we realized it needed one last touch. As I've said, uh, uh, you know, our idea about content is fundamentally related to the bringing together of a discourse around a given object. And as much as we value the writing of our authors, of course, uh, we also found it interesting that you could register that discourse through the footnotes themselves. So we made this little companion piece. Um, it's a pamphlet. It's also online. So you can Google it and find it. It's called Footnotes on Climate. Um, and it's really just a collection of what we saw as some of the central footnotes uh, and discursive uh, 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 entries that really framed the project. You've probably caught the playful nod to Peter Eisenman's uh, notes on a conceptual architecture uh, here. And what I would insist is that for us, uh, a project like this isn't uh, the evacuation of content by any means. It's not a lack, but rather it's a sort of explication of how we see content. Uh, by sort of foregrounding those discursive networks that usually sit um, in the background. So the content here, uh, you might say, would be the essay uh, yet to be written. Thanks. Hi, <clears throat> everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Sigler. Um, I'm starting off on a slightly different note. Um, no Derrida or Montaigne. Um, this was Julie Andrews' Sound of Music, um, which is a bit more in the spirit of uh, where we're coming from with Harvard Design Magazine. Uh, so I want to thank Chantel for bringing us together 
to tonight to talk about our publishing projects and for, to all of you for coming. Um, Chantelle asked us to address the question, what is content? And um, I decided to give this talk this name, um, even though it's quite banal, I think it deserves to be reconsidered, and I'm dead serious. Because uh, when we talk about content, we need to talk about the package itself and not just what's inside it. Um, I also tend to go uh, back to childhood um, instinctively when we talk about complex topics like this because it always seems like a way of getting back to the essential. Um, I'm not an academic and I'm not an architect and um, I think like Jeff Dyer the other night, I, I think that sometimes talking about what you're not does help to define where you're coming from um, and what you're doing. Um, I have been deeply immersed in this world um, for quite a long time and I've always, I think, approached my work very much as a maker um, and it's always been very fueled by the tension of belonging and not belonging and um, what one can do with that. Um, so this presentation is very much um, in that spirit. And I think that rather than talking about the magazine, which I do a little bit, um, it's really a little bit more of a demonstration of uh, the magazine um, and the way we think and the way we approach things. Um, so indeed, brown packages are apparently our favorite things these days. Julie Andrews was right. We love and we crave the promise of the package, the moment of anticipation, the moment just before opening and discovering, maybe more than we crave what's inside it. And largely thanks to Jeff Bezos and, Am and Amazon, the excitement of the brown paper package and the chore of recycling our boxes has become our way of life. And of course, what we're seeing here and what we're talking about isn't just the brown box as a package, it's also the warehouse as a package holding unlimited content and the magazine or book or publication as a package. Uh, by coincidence, um, a magazine um, is also a word for a warehouse. Um, and for me, it's very much a spatial medium. Um, it's a container for stories, for arguments, for ideas that are expressed in words and images. Um, my background, as, as Michael said, um, did my, my relationship with architecture began with SMLXL, um, which was a very hands-on project and a project that really did look at the book as, um, as space. Um, a magazine, and we use the word magazine, not journal and not review very intentionally. Um, a magazine is also, as it turns out, a cartridge for bullets. Um, it's a metaphor I hate to use in these times, and yet it's useful in that it suggests a modularity and the possibility of releasing or launching units sequentially or periodically. A periodical by nature exists and evolves in time and with time. And I think the difference between um, you know, being thematic and not being thematic and using time as a guide is a very um, interesting project to talk about um, in publishing. A magazine can also, of course, be a form of ammunition. As in the date paintings of Ankawara, time creates a framework, a rhythm for structuring content. Time is part of the content, and to an extent it guides content. So we're releasing bullets of content over time. These are meant to be launched into a world that's broader than Harvard and broader than the name, than the arena of the design disciplines. So each issue strives to make connections and juxtapositions between architecture and design and other fields on issues that relate to space and to what we call the built environment. When we redesigned the magazine three years ago, and uh, this was in collab close collaboration with Leah Whitman Sulkin um, and Meg Sandberg and the designers with projects um, in New York, um, we didn't take anything for granted, including the name and we really wanted to start by looking at these three words, Harvard, design, and magazine, and saying, what are we doing here? What do we want to name this thing? Where do we start? And these words really felt flat and dusty, and we thought about abandoning the name altogether, and it seemed very, very Harvard. 
Um, and we thought about dozens of more catchy and ultimately dull and embarrassing alternatives. Um, but in the end, it was more invigorating to just dust off these words and to really re-examine them and think critically about what they mean or what they could mean and what we could do with them and how we could activate them. So we broke them open and we used them to generate our new approach and a frame for our content. And we tried to give the name a deeper and more intentional resonance. And it was very important that we wanted each issue to open with a question rather than to try to present conclusions. Um, and it wasn't until later that I realized that that fourth open corner was really the corner um, to let in that question and I think to let in a new kind of reader and a new kind of, um, or a different kind of approach to editing. So it happens that uh, Chantel's question, um, what is content, um, is especially resonant for me at the moment or for our team at the moment because the next issue of Harvard Design Magazine's shelf life will deal with storage. We're starting to lay it out this week. This is the preliminary cover, or the packaging, so to speak. Um, our covers always present a frame for the content, visually, intellectually, and atmospherically. And again, atmosphere, space, time, and sound are very important to the space of the, of the, or the experience of the magazine. And within the visual frame of the title, there's always another smaller frame, a rectangle, which might represent a surface or a patch or a field or a mirror or a window looking in or looking out to the space of the issue. It's a point of entry. So I want to share some of the contents of this issue, which in itself will deal with how and where we store the contents of our lives and of our world. We approach each issue with a prompt um, I don't think there's time now to read this to you, but we reach out to a huge range of contributors. Some are scholarly, some are academic, some are practitioners, and many come from other fields. And this is always a combination of makers, artists, thinkers, writers, poets, scientists. Um, and I think that this is really a, a topic to debate. Um, you know. To what extent do we want to put architecture into dialogue with these other fields? What can we do with that? And why is it necessary? And can we do that without abandoning uh, disciplinary principles? Um, that's something I've always believed in, naturally, and it's part of being in this space between being an outsider and an insider um, that I try to use productively. Um, and because I like to do what I'm interested in, simply. <laughs> Um, so in this issue, um, as you might have read while I was talking, we've been thinking a lot about containers and what's contained and the construction and meaning of both and also how this applies to content. As editors and writers and architects, it's, inter it's important to think about the difference between contents and content and to ask what's inside these boxes, these packages. And what is inside these boxes? These two belong to the artist Myra Kalman from New York. They're not meant to be opened. What are the contents and what is the content? Two different things. The content, I would argue, is more than the sum of its parts, of its contents. The contents of the box on the left of the ashes of the artist's dog. But the content of the book is, of course, much more. It's this particular box holding these particular ashes of this particular dog's life and the memories and their meaning for this person on this shelf at this time and photographed at this particular angle and presented with this particular handwriting in juxtaposition with the pink box. And then there are all kinds of questions we could ask about the history of the flowered box before it held the ashes and how will this content change in the space of our magazine and in the minds of the reader? And obviously, this is, is, it's part of the next issue, but it's also, I think, very much a metaphor for how we can um, approach a range of content um, throughout the production of Harvard Design Magazine. Um, so the table of contents of any publication is really just an inventory. And as editors, our role is to generate the frame and modulate that inventory and this may be obvious, but I think it's a very important distinction. And we can ask this question about architecture, of course, but also about publications. 
So what are the contents of these boxes, and what's the content, and what's the difference? And what about these, or these, or these, or these? Is content information or data? Or is content meaning or value or ideas or emotions? Is it something we can hold or count? Or is it something more abstract, more intellectual, more personal? Whose identities are stored here? Or here? Or here? How does symbolic content differ from physical content? Is architecture without content or without contents content? Does the container prescribe the content or vice versa? Is content what we put in or is it what we take out? How does the frame define the content? or change the content, or become the content? And when does the content become the frame? Do more contents equal more content? Or are contents and content inversely propor proportional? Does our surplus of stuff mask a bigger void? Should we tidy up or curate more carefully? So with a nod to McLuhan's medium is the message or the massage or the mass age or the mess age, I want to suggest that the container is the content and the context and maybe the contest. Open at your own risk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chantal. It's really exciting to be here with uh, fellow editors. We don't get to do this very much and hear each other talk. Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion, too. Um, as, I'm, as everyone said, we've been asked to answer what is content. I mean, for me, it's really quite specific. Uh, and in an order to explain, I think I need to um, set the scene, if you excuse the literary term, since we're talking about literature. Um, so first, the protagonists. Um, Praxis was founded in the late 90s um, as I was graduating from Columbia. Two of my classmates, Amanda Reeser Lawrence and Irina Verona and I, were really looking um, to, for a kind of creative venue to sustain us through our first postgraduate day jobs. Um, our intention was to launch Praxis as a kind of umbrella organization um, that uh, under which we could collaborate on various ventures. We really thought, we knew we were going to produce a journal and we wanted to do that, but we also imagined we would enter competitions and perhaps even eventually build projects. Um, we gathered a small group of colleagues, uh, which included Mi Jin Yoon, uh, Eric Howler, Anna Milyaki, uh, Ron Rail, who's at Berkeley. I think you probably know the others from around here. Um, at the time, we were each working in different cities, different offices, different universities, but we were all working as architects. Um, uh, we were inspired by Vittorio Gregotti, who is a practicing architect, uh, simultaneously was the editor of Casabella. Um, and he once wrote, um, for an architect to edit a magazine is a way of cultivating theoretical reflections, not as a separate activity, but an indispensable part of design craft. So that's the protagonist and the context, uh, nod to Michael and his introduction uh, sort of follow from that. You know, it was the late 90s and these, in our minds, were the primary players on the US uh, periodical scene, or at least they are representing the primary players. Um, so you've got uh, Michael's assemblage uh, and Reed Krolov's architecture. So there were trade publications you know, on the right hand that really dealt with the making of architecture, with buildings, with projects, with technologies. And on the left, academic publications um, uh, that were really addressed the kind of thinking 
of architecture. Um, and as Michael mentioned, uh, you know, Assemblage's focus was a kind of broad discussion of design culture, but to us it sometimes seemed um, kind of removed or tangential almost to to building. Um, so, you know, today I, I would suppose, oh, sorry, back up. Um, you could still find that kind of distinction, um, say, between log and design. Um, maybe design doesn't really even qualify as literature, but it's another topic. Uh, but, you know, back to the 90s, um, we were really just responding to that divide, the divide between the kind of thinking and making of architecture. And most simply, we decided to found Praxis to bring together those two things, um, uh, or as we put it more concisely, uh, writing and building uh, in a really simple, sort of straightforward way. So the simple answer um, to the question of what is content, content for us is a kind of promiscuous intermingling of history, theory, landscape, urbanism, art, technology, and building. Um, so that's the kind of backstory, the sort of two minute version, and I'm gonna use the remaining 10 minutes I have to expand on that a bit. Um, so conceptually, content really is material that we are actively participating in producing instead of material we receive and reproduce. Um, and while content is material that we act on, it's also work that we react to. And we do that by sort of shifting and reorienting the journal's theme, all of our journals are themed, um, in response to ideas that uh, emerge from our discoveries. Our engagement with content really, we see it as, um, is really to create a space for its emergence. Um, all that may sound a bit abstract, so I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk with a few specifics. Um, and in keeping with the idea of emerging content, um, uh, like James did, I really talk about it in terms of verbs rather than nouns. Um, so I've got five verbs, um, roughly two minutes each, curate, research, draw, design, and question. So to curate, um, what does it mean to curate? Strictly speaking, to curate is to store, to look after, or preserve exhibits. Um, but the expanded definition of curation um, includes collecting, organizing, and framing a coherent body of work on a particular topic in an informative and critical manner. Um, so each of our issues is uh, organized around a theme. We have a whole series of different ones. Um, we have some that are typologically driven, like the housing issue or the um, the museum issue. We have ones that are sort of more conceptually driven, one about uh, capitalism, uh, program or uh, surface. Then we have some that kind of push disciplinary boundaries, like the landscapes issue or the uh, urban matters issue. And then we have um, some that like stay really closely within disciplinary boundaries like the detail or technology. Um, the topics really begin with a loosely defined notion um, that develops over time as we begin to work with material. Uh, the intention isn't for the theme to work as a cataloging device that reflects the current state of the discipline, but really as a means to advance discourse. Um, so, uh, in terms of curation, um, the issue, for example, on Mexico City um, uh, took a position um, a after several weeks of being there and doing research uh, on reading the, simulta the city simultaneously at macro and micro scales. We used a kind of powers of 10 means to navigate through the issue, always framing projects in relationship to neighborhoods. So each one of those rectangular boxes is a neighborhood that ends up getting described. Um, in an area like this, and then each project is um, defined, uh, or its kind of immediate vicinity is defined in one of these boxes, that then finds itself on the uh, on the cover uh, or the sort of front, sorry, uh, the front page of the uh, each each uh, project article. Um, so. Uh, we often, another way we curate, um, we often pair projects or group projects, in this case, in the issue on surface. We took two very well uh, published projects uh, of Herzog and Dermorans, and I'm hoping you don't even recognize it here because that was kind of the intention, but we were really interested in looking at the way that surface was made. And so the focus is really on how those were developed conceptually and technically. Um, and then there's that kind of pairing back and forth. So uh, the walkers on one side and uh, uh, the de Young is on the other always. They kind of. Um, 
So next, research. Um, our content often includes documentation and representation of research we do to expand the theme. Uh, you know, for example, housing uh, Mexico City at the bottom. These are, uh, you know, work that we did as editors, really, uh, to help expand uh, the discourse. I mean, even small scale things, we get kind of obsessive about things. Like we did this uh, parallel interview with Shumi and Coolhouse, and after we did the interview and we were editing it, we realized that there were so many connections between their careers and education. We decided to make a kind of timeline of uh, documenting all of those events. Um, uh, in the issue on museums, um, we cataloged all of the major museum commissions that were awarded globally between Bilbao in 1997 and 2004 when the issue was published. There were 66 of them. Um, we researched and compi compiled a kind of exquisite corpse narrative of quotes by the mayors on the economic benefit that each museum would bring their respective city. Um, and then and then we also cataloged uh, and cross-referenced the plans of each museum and documented uh, a set of statistical data, including the location, the architect, the cost of the construction, cost of admission, square footage of the museum, and size of the gift shop. Um, we draw. Uh, we painstakingly redraw uh, every single drawing we get, because they never print properly. Uh, so they read. That's really important to us. Um, but then we also find ourselves annotating them uh, in ways that they make more sense, uh, or they tell a story about the project. Um, we often find ourselves as editors producing entirely new drawings of projects. So like, for example, the section diagram that we did for uh, Diller Scafidio's Blur Building, we did because we felt like it was important to explain the way it worked. Um, in fact, I got a call from Liz about a year later. She's like, where did you get that? And uh, she thought her office had produced it and she couldn't find it. And I was like, no, we, we made that. Uh, so um, we do things like that, crazy things like that. Uh, 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 diagram of uh, the ramps in Mac and Merrill's um, Knowlton Hall. Um, for a long time, we did, instead of doing bio pages, we decided to do it as graphic timelines. Um, and uh, for the technology issue, uh, we cataloged all of the, so this is both drawing and, I suppose, uh, research. We cataloged and researched and documented all the technologies that were used by each of the projects created in the issue. Um, and we format, formatted them as a kind of two-page spread that looks like the Mac Master Car catalog. So we kind of have fun with it, too. Um, questioning. So for us, questioning uh, generates uh, content much more organically, allowing complex, uh, sometimes unexpected, and even difficult content to emerge. Um, our first editorial uh, set forth the premise of the journal in five questions. And we still work through questions, uh, sometimes way too many, which means it's why your praxis comes out so late sometimes, uh, very late. Um, we question our preconceptions about topics. Uh, we question every potential article uh, or project against that topic. We question how the issue is structured, how many images, how images and text relate on each page, et cetera, et cetera. But we also use questions generatively um, to, do, to create content. Um, we've done a whole series of these parallel interviews. We started one in the first issue, and we found them really productive, so we did more of them. Um, we've done uh, just a, a series of sort of email exchanges. Um, there's uh, questionnaires that we send out to gather uh, you know, different perspectives on single issues. Um, and in issue 12, the entire issue was structured around a series of interviews uh, done by architects of other architects. It was a kind of round robins um, to create a kind of intergenerational conversation or a snapshot of, um, of these 12 practices um, and what the issues were. We even uh, did the editorial of that issue as a, an interview, too. Um, and lastly, design, and this one for me is the one that's the most fun because it's really the place where all of my frustrated architectural design energy goes. Um, uh, it's always been a criteria for us that uh, the covers are not a representation of the editorial position, but they are intended really to operate as or participate in that position. Um, and what do I mean by that? I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the landscape issue. Um, 
we first of all reference the shift in the scale of the projects that was captured by this kind of pixelated image. This is a pixelated image of blur, um, but that doesn't resolve at the distance that you hold the journal. You actually don't see this image unless you're, you have a, a, a significant distance from it. So there's the, that piece to it. But then also we were thinking of landscapes as kind of thickened, Multi -laminar, uh, multivalent laminar surfaces. And so the cover itself was composed of multiple layers with words that describe different kinds of landscapes, each one of these taken from the article titles that then, as you move through the journal, resolves itself into the table of contents. Um, for the technology issue, it was important that the cover uh, not just represent technology, but be a technology. Um, you know, what kind of technology would you have, and a new technology at that, and what kind of technology do you have for a cover, but the ink uh, or the paper? Um, so we found this thermochromic ink. It's the first use of thermochromic ink at this scale. Um, we initially intended to flood the cover with, ink, with the thermochromic ink, so it was just solid. Um, but uh, like any good architecture project, the first ink quote was twice our budget. Um, so we wrote a script, yet another technology, to design a cover that had 40% ink coverage and bring it in under budget. Um, and then in this, the surface of the um, cover goes clear at body temperature, revealing both the mechanism behind that surface that was on this and then also the table of contents. So you can only read the table of contents if you've been handling the journal. Um, and then the last one, expanding surface. Um, uh, you know, we came up with this kind of graphic uh, fairly quickly for us. This, uh, the way the the kind of image begins to erode the masthead, and you know, after a series, this was uh, issue nine, and the previous eight covers had, or actually previous nine covers, because we started with zero, um, but the previous. Um, Nine had been really agonizing, and I said, you know, we just need a simple cover this time. So we did this. We actually were done with the cover about a month before we went to print, and I had the proof up on my um, wall, which was a big mistake, um, because one day I was sitting there looking at it, and I uh, just said, you know, I wonder what would happen if we perforated it. Um, so we did a really crude ver version that day uh, in the building uh, on the laser cutter, um, and I realized we really had to do this. So but it took five hours to cut. So we did a whole series of tests, like the technology issue, it came down to budget, which was time on the laser cutter. Obviously we couldn't print 4,000 at five hours each. Um, so we did all these different tests, uh, different sizes, different shapes. And we also were having problems with the laser cutter not cutting them in order. So for a while my intern was like literally cutting and pasting each one of 38,000 holes to get them to print in order, which was madness. And um, we uh, finally decided, uh, Mi Jin Yoon came up with a former student of hers who was a scripting whiz, uh, Stelius Dristus, um, and he came up, we worked together to come up, oh, these are some of the tests we did, we were doing different shapes and sizes of holes. Um, and this is our communication back and forth about like how we can make this work. And he came up with this beautiful script that allowed us to test more and more options. Uh, and these were some of the ones that tested and here's the final cover. Um, so uh, I've just shared a few of these, but there's similar stories about each one. I would say for us, they're really where this editing, back to the uh, Gregotti, Quote, where editing and creative pro production obviously coalesce into new content. And although Praxis as an office that designs projects never materialized, I'd argue that the content of the journal itself is a form of design project. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it goes without saying that I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, I'm very grateful to Chantelle and to the GSD for their kind invitation. Um, and because I only have 12 minutes, I'm going to get straight to it. Um, this is AA Files. Um, AA Files is the journal of the AA School of Architecture. And it's been going in one form or another, under one title or another, since the mid-19th century. 
Over the last 10 years, under my editorship, I've tried to make AA files as kind of outward looking as possible, rather than simply as a parochial house journal of a school in London. And for people to read it not necessarily as a way of demonstrating their allegiance to the AA, as a kind of token of their tribalism, but because they want to be stimulated, engaged, or entertained by good architectural writing. In terms of content inside each issue, there are in effect only three things. There are essays, there are images, and there are conversations. The choice of um, each of these forms is not neutral or assumed, but quite specific. So let's look at the first of them and the essay. I should also sort of preface all of these by my kind of envy at James's very succinct um, uh, summary of the essay. I mean, I'm going to just be covering the same territory. Um, I'm kind of furious that I didn't get that Robert Musel quote because he would have definitely been in. Um, this is a graphic I produced in homage to the French uh, graphic designer Massin in collaboration with the fine graphic designers from Perspecta. Um, and it shows that an essay, as Aldous Huxley um, once defined it, is a literary device, a device for saying almost anything, or uh, saying almost everything about almost anything, or that it deliberately, or that it is deliberately irregular and undigested, according to Samuel Johnson, or for Theodore Adorno, that it reflects a childlike freedom that catches fire on what others have already done, or according to the architectural historian Alan Colquhoun. An essay is part of a history of rhetoric, moving knowledge from the spe specialist to all educated people. More polemically, I think the essay can offer a challenge to the dominant form of writing about architecture laid down by almost 300 years of largely German scholarship, a convention established and maintained by these guys. This is Winkelmann, Zemper, Burkhardt, Riegel, Wolflin, Gideon, Panofsky, Gombrich, Vickhover, and Pevsner. I would argue that all academic writing about architecture is still informed by this tradition, from the paper to the thesis to that rusty old vessel of bad sentences, otherwise known as the PhD. <laughs> I think we should challenge all of these forms of writing. And by the way, I think we should challenge this, not just in journals, but also in schools. Now, the essay, I think, offers that challenge. Through it, I think we can promote a different tradition, more ostensibly French and English than German, and with its own alternative lineage. Montaigne, who we know, the inventor of the essay, Bacon, Milton, Johnson, Ruskin, De Quincey, Pater, Benjamin, Strachey, Wolf, Huxley, and Bath. And interestingly, an extension of this family tree would also include perhaps the five greatest architectural writers of the 20th century, John Summerson, Colin Rowe, Alan Colquhoun, Raina Bannum, and Robin Evans, all of whom, by and large, only ever wrote in the essay form. I believe then that with the essay and with architectural essayists like the wonderful Robin Evans, we can far better communicate architecture's accessibility and inherent sense of style, as much as we can play to its more artful tendencies, its writerliness, rather than, rather than its technocracy, and that through the quality of the essay's innate good sentences, we can also reaffirm the fact that architecture always has been and remains a language. It therefore follows that the quality of that language defines the quality of that architecture. But at the same time, I think a good journal needs more than just essays. And in this sense, I subscribe to the Alice in Wonderland school of editorship, that what we also need are good pictures and good conversations. I'm just going to show a few kind of spreads from A files now. Um, this, by the way, is the very, very bad Curzio Malapate. Um, in AA files, I don't like pictures as illustrations, something hierarchically secondary to text, or like a kind of receipt to an idea. I much prefer images to be on an equal footing to text, so that they can be as communicative and articulate as the text, and also so that you can really see them. Similarly, if I commission some poor student to meticulously draw the rose window and south transept of Notre Dame's cathedral, 
then I feel I owe it to them to give the drawing one whole page on its own. <laughs> or if I've somehow managed to secure image rights to two archival and unpublished Saul Steinberg drawings, then I want to show them all by themselves on their own spread. Or if I have one of the great Mies drawings from uh, the Razor House, then it would be simply wrong to show it in any other way than all by itself across a double page spread. Um, after the essay and the image, here's the third aspect of my content, the conversation. And it's interesting, given what Ashley just said with her take on conversations, in a sense, we're all dealing with the same content here. Um, the only difference is form. Um, in each issue of AA Files, I commissioned two conversations. And here are a few of the ones I've published. People like Korea with Kevin Roach, with Itsuko Hasegawa, Lewis Bouts, and so on. All of these conversations are very deliberately structured around their subject's autobiography. For me, it is one of the oddities of architectural historiography that we only ever seem to know about an architect's work and never their life. Critics, historians, commentators, and even architects themselves talk only through commissions, not through biography. And yet, personally, I would always prefer to listen to an architect talking about their life than their work. Through the rendition of these lives, I also think these conversations can attack the other sacred cow of architecture, the project. A word, I think, that should only really be vocalized in our best kind of Pierre Vittorio Aureli impression, a kind of the project. Um, and I think it's a word that has somehow become incredibly pompous in architectural kind of uh, uh, vernacular. So, this is John Winter, by the way. Um, counter to the kind of seriousness or earnestness of the project, I also like the autobiographic model because it introduces it into architecture's otherwise unsmiling lexicon qualities like the ability to recount a story or to tell a joke, or to be self-deprecating. That is, none of the things normally associated with architects, but actually qualities they all have. Um, this is John Winter, who was a kind of rather little-known English architect, contemporary of James Sterling's, and in a very characteristically self-deprecatory way, revealing quite why he isn't part of architectural history. Now, I realize, though, that Essays, images, and conversations are actually all examples of form, not content. And so what then really is the stuff of A-files? What's inside? The simple answer is that I always like architecture to be mediated through the objecthood of its buildings, its drawings, its books, and even its architects. This is my real content. This is also a kind of revolt against my own 1990s education, when very little of these things seem to matter certainly in comparison with the value then placed on philosophical inquiry and theoretical speculation. But personally, I like the stuff of architecture, and I take real pleasure in buildings, in books, and in drawings. What I don't like is architectural discourse that theorizes first and only afterwards applies this to some seemingly random physical exemplar. I much prefer writing that begins with the material description of a thing and then carefully unravels the associated ideas embedded within it, all the while developing a history or a critique. So here are kind of a few title pages of this actual content in A-Files, all of this kind of object-related content. Um, so in this case, it, these are just essays that very, very explicitly take as their subject an architect. So Hilbersheimer, Geverican, Lasden, Malaparte, George Finch, or Joseph Albers. Or there's essays on buildings, on installations, on drawings, on typologies, or proposals. Or essays that find architectural objects from within other disciplines, like classics, like fashion, like semiotics, like the history of science, like art, or like psychoanalysis.
but the very physical printed nature of the journal also allow, allows me to present it as its own object and one that you experience through its own architecture. So through its color and it's through its materiality, through its adjacency of text and image or the unthemed juxtaposition of one article next to another, or through its interiors, or through its verticality, or through its surprise, or through its scale. And if one of my contributors writes a great piece about Geoponte's endearingly ideogrammatic uh, letter writing and has as an example a letter in the form of a boiled egg, then I'm not interested in a theory of this egg, but in the intelligence of its description, the matter-of-factness of its envelope, the one-to-oneness of its letter, and the qualities of its shell and its yolk. That's it. Thanks. Maybe to complete the introduction, we are both architects and we have both practices, which is not an important, uh, because San Rocco is a magazine uh, run by architects, practicing architects. So we'll give you a very brief introduction to San Rocco. I'd say, and I'm sorry, Tom, uh, <laughs> San Rocco, the magazine, is a project, but perhaps... Um, <laughs> Perhaps we're Italian enough as a magazine to, to claim such things. Um, it is a project which is started by four architecture offices, two photographers and one graphic designer. Initially, it was a project with a five-year plan and a very well-written plan of 20 issues. Now, we decided a few months ago to stop San Rocco after two more, actually three more issues to to go. So after 15 issues and six years. So you see, we were not so good in counting. San Rocco's, I would say the center of San Rocco is a call for papers. It's a central text and it becomes in every <coughs> next issue the editorial. Since San Rocco is a project, we consider everybody who contributes to San Rocco, apart from ourselves, of course, somehow voluntary prisoners of our own project. And we always felt that everybody understood that. At least that's what we think. So in that sense, I think you can see San Rocco somehow as an, an enterprise, like an office, where there's projects and there's collaborators. But then again, within that office, within that project of that office, what's its content? Here we are then. Um, let's say, uh, San Rocco, uh, from the very beginning, we thought of San Rocco as a manifesto. Again, a very, let's say, uh, is as, as saying that San Rocco is a project. And this manifesto, uh, it's certainly cloudy and confused, but it's nevertheless a manifesto. And um, let's say now listing in a random order the possible content of this manifesto, um, let's say the even cover field is the context of uh, architecture. Um, history is the basis of uh, architectural knowledge. A knowledge which is in its essence totally shared uh, and totally public. And this knowledge um, is an informal accumulation of formal knowledge and as such its, uh, its means of expression are uh, the traditional ones of architecture, so like saying plans and, and, and sections and, and axles and so forth. And um, let's say this knowledge is uh, the status of this knowledge. It's uh, certainly in hybrid, so in between science and, and, and human science. 
and as such, let's say, is not as uh, is not totally predictable and not totally unpredictable. And one last thing, uh, in a way, it is uh, knowledge is um, very much similar to the sort of Anglo-Saxon idea of law. So it's built by cases, and it's not a top-down kind of uh, system like a, a typical theoretical system. And that's that's it. That's a, it. A non-dogmatic accumulation of formal knowledge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Those are great presentations. Um, so what I plan to do is, is try to get a conversation started down here first. But I do want to turn it to the audience uh, soon, so you could be thinking and preparing uh, questions. Let, let me first, um, this came up in a couple of presentations, the difference between thematic issues driving it. Um, Versus, I'm not sure what. If they weren't, if 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 the journals, if the magazines, are they all magazines or some journals? Yours is a journal. Yeah, I'm a snob. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I'm if a you're a journal. I'm really a serial publication, I think. Or, I think you're more like a serial <laughs> publication. You're not very period <laughs> yes, periodical. Not very um, but but um, I want to think about the the themes. I, I had. To, a couple of observations, and it has to do with AA files and praxis. They're very heavily editor uh, uh, determined by the editors, I felt. Uh, the, the, the themes that Ashley and Amanda generate, though, though always generous in, in the, the author, you know, sort of the authors covered, it's not all from one region or one school or anything like that. They're heavily edited. And I felt the same a little bit, Thomas, about AA files. There's a lot of Thomas in AA files, I, I, I feel like. How do you, uh, compare to Jennifer, who's also doing thematic issues, but there's so much out, outward reach. There's so much uh, connectivity and un, uh, heterogeneity, I would say, that it didn't feel as heavily edited. How do you assure, I'm asking Thomas and Ashley, that it's not a kind of snobbery, that it's not a kind of too idiosyncratic. Because they don't, the magazines don't have the reputation of being highly tendentious. They don't. But why, but why don't they? I mean, maybe. They, <laughs> 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 they, yeah. I, mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I should apologize in a way. I mean, I think. People now assume certain roles, architect, curator, editor, and often they enjoy the assignation of the role or the name without then doing the, doing the job. And I think if you're going to be the editor, then edit. Um, but I have a bad um, backseat driver tendency to want to reach for the steering wheel the whole time anyway. Um, so I enjoy the fact that there's this multiplicity of things that come to me and I can grab the wheel. Mm -hmm. I, um, but for sure, there's a lot of me there. But I try and do it as nicely as I can. Um, and my interest is, is to make the journal as have its own distinct kind of voice and characteristic. Um, yet at the same time, I am fully committed to un, an unthemed journal. I like, I mean, the model I always I always look back on is a kind of Rethian uh, BBC model of a kind of idea that one simply turns it on, knowing that there's going to be something good there. Not quite sure what it is. Or a kind of New Yorker model. You just get it, and you, you're just reassured by the fact that something good is going to be inside. 
rather than this sort of notion of the editor as someone with a kind of x-ray goggles who is seeing something that no one else sees and gives that thing a name um, and then writes an editorial in a sense declaring um, that that new phase that we're entering in life I don't think we're very I mean, you're absolutely right. We're incredibly heavily edited. Um, but at the same time, I think the whole process by which, and this is why it takes a year between issues and sometimes two, um, you know, there's a, a kind of an emerging topic that we think, wow, this seems really interesting. And we're really very sincere about that. Uh, we do open things up for submissions. Uh, in all honesty, we don't end up getting a whole lot of submissions that are really truly on topic, but and then we go out and we're um, asking, you know, through our networks of people, like who's doing something in this any, you know, in in, in this sort of realm of things. Uh, you know, our first pinup, we probably have a hundred potential articles, and it's kind of we weed it down, not based on anything other than trying to find a kind of constellation of pieces that come together. And so, yes, it's, it's incredibly he heavily edited in, in that respect, but I, I don't think it's exclusive in any way. I mean, in fact, we've always set out to intentionally um, include, um, I mean, in, in, the, in those first questions, uh, one of our questions was, you know, can we find work other than on the coasts to, mm -hmm. to publish, you know? Can we, you know? So part of our mission really was to find New people, different people. Uh, I mean, certainly we, you know, we do publish Herzog and Demeron, but we also publish a lot of. We published uh, uh, Work AC before they really had produced anything. So, um, you know, we were always sort of searching for the new and 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 sort of a ver variety of voices. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it seems to me that the risk is missing is missing being able to map emergent discourses before you know what they are. So I, for me, San Rocco, for example, achieves a kind of balance between setting a theme, but but it's, it's themes like, I can't remember some of, yeah. Monks I mean, monkeys. sorry? Monks and monkeys. Monks and monkeys, yes, themes like monks and monkeys. So, so effectively, effectively, what Sinroco sometimes becomes is a registration device for emergent discourses without deciding ahead of time what those discourses are. I don't know if you, you agree with that characterization. And, and maybe James, you could jump in here too because Avery, for me, is the most open thematically. I, I will talk about its closeness in terms of authorship <laughs> later, but, but, but it, it seems open thematically to people from Colombia, at least. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the, no, I mean, I think for us the, the theme question is a really important one because what I would like for the journal to be is to uh, be extremely responsive to uh, what feel like the really sort of urgent questions of the field at any given time. And I, I, I think that's some of what happens when you go online. like. We churn things out really fast, and so it, the I would say the sort of gestation life of an issue is really about six weeks because the next one is hot on its heels, um, and it, it, it's 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 an intense thing. But it, it allows us to be sort of very uh, agile in responding to uh, current. It, it's the model of the review. You want the review to be somewhat fresh. We do. Um, I, I, we do also sort of drift into theming, and when we do that is when we go physical. So we, we strike a very sort of ambivalent position there that the website is absolutely unthemed for the reasons mentioned. Uh, but that then as a sort of project seems to coalesce within the journal, uh, we, we start to think about how it might take the more sort of uh, uh, durable form of, of mm -hmm. the book. What is the what is the period of Avery? We come out monthly. Monthly. Um, and it, it, we, we try to keep the issues small for that reason. It's, it's mm -hmm. really four to six. Um, essays. Uh, I think we're still proud of all of them. I mean, it does like it, at that speed, you you, yeah. you misfire sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I would. It, this is why we call it an attempt. To like, I, I think that the, the possibility of the misfire is is baked into how we work. And uh, I think we fire more often than we misfire. But 
there are a few in there. Kirsten. Yeah, well, of course, and Rocco, I guess, is a little bit the odd one out here with, in this collection of magazines because we are not agile and we are not responsive. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we No, in a way, everything which we've been doing until now, we somehow announced uh, six years ago. So, because we made this five-year plan, as we quickly mentioned. Um, of course, maybe a very different dynamic is at work there. That is that, uh, I guess, somehow it is possible to represent even the generation or, or things which are very current uh, simply by predefining what you're after. Uh, and then people who feel connected to that, they, they somehow appear. And I guess that's what happened with San Rocco up to mm -hmm. point. So despite the fact that, and I guess to this evening, because the question was about content, and perhaps it was the first time we were so honest and open about our own content, but in a way, as I, as I said, perhaps uh, a very often abused word, but San Rocco has always been a project with a clear idea, uh, a clear interest, any, like Andrea was explaining, a manifesto, you could call it, or even a very premeditated story about what is good and what is bad architecture up to mm -hmm. point. Um, but funnily enough, um, if you throw that on the table, there's plenty of people who say, oh yeah, but we also think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I guess that's the, the logic of the magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's somehow you say something with 20 or 30 percent of what you publish, at least that's what you would like to say, and then there's 70 percent uh, who also say something, and sometimes that adds up and you say much more than you ever imagined you would be saying. And sometimes it's a little bit confusing, but that's also fine. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a little bit how it works. Yeah, it, re related to that, could and maybe uh, bring Jennifer and HDM together with San Rocco and this question. Um, it seems that once you set a theme, it seems to me you still allow unsolicited material. It, it feels, you, you yeah, do. No. No. Yeah, up to yes. a point. Could, could you speak about that? Yeah. I mean, up to a point because it's not as democratic as it would appear. Ah, okay. uh, I mean, uh, let's say the, the call for papers is honestly there, I mean, presenting a topic. Yeah. But then the process of selecting the materials which, which arrived, I mean, it's totally undemocratic. And let's say you have to allow some dissonant voices to be in for the okay. sake of the argument in itself, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, let's say to more to reinforce the argument than to to really open it up. So, really uh, in, a, in a way, although I don't want to talk too long about San Rocco, but I, I guess the reason why also now, after six years, uh, we decided to, to soon stop. Well, it's first of all, of course, because we always claimed we would only do it five years in twenty issues, but we never managed to make four issues a year. That was impossible. Um, but also because. Um, in a way, it's like um, it's an argument you build up over a whole set of issues, and at a certain point, you realize that somehow you have said what you would like to say. And, and I think that's what, within our small group of people, I think we start to increasingly feel. And strangely enough, increasingly, you have uh, plenty of answers to the call for papers, which we cannot even manage ourselves, yeah. and which do not necessarily add up to the argument. So, yeah. so you know, it gets saturated. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, you speak to this? Um, no, I'm on a totally different planet, actually. <laughs> no, um, no, it, it all, I mean, everything that, that you were all saying um, makes sense, but I'm, I mean, when you say, like, I'm almost offended that you say not heavily edited, because mm -hmm. I feel that, I mean, almost to the point of um, embarrassment, that it is so personal. Mm -hmm. and so edited, but I think what you call editing, um, or what we call editing, it, it really um, maybe needs to be opened up. Um, so mm -hmm. for me, the process of making an issue um, is not highly preconceived. So in that sense that it's not as if I have a vision from the beginning of what it's going to be at the end. But every issue is a laboratory. Um, and as that theme and that title and that list of potential contributors evolves and grows and the brainstorm kind of emerges, it's really a kind of mixture of, of 
left brain and right brain activity in a way, and being very methodical and structured on the one hand and very intuitive on the other. Mm -hmm. And the editorial process is a way is in a way not a project, but it's it's life in a way. I mean, to the point that you look at and read and see and think and respond to, or I do, everything around me through the lens or through the optic, to use a GSD word, um, of that issue and what that issue is going to be. And it's, it's almost as if you're wearing the, the glasses of, of that lens for the entire period of incubation and, you know, to the point of the last day going to press, you know, you're thinking, oh, we gotta, we've got to find a way to fold this in, or, you know, we didn't deal with this, and how can we? And really trying to kind of enable those juxtapositions and those confrontations. So I think it's, it's editing as an exploration and as an experiment, as opposed to as um, a demonstration of a preconceived notion. Mm -hmm. But don't you know every you know the work of every author you solicit? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily, okay. Um, okay. Not necessarily. No, very often um, it's a process of, um, we would like to find someone, upcoming issue um, on storage, mm -hmm. the pocket. We wanted to think about the pocket as a storage device, as a form of architecture, like the pocket in your pants or in your coat. Um, who can write on the pocket? And I mean, that really becomes in itself a kind of research project. Mm -hmm. Who is that voice? Who is out there? Mm -hmm. It's not someone in this room. And I, that's what's exciting to me, is that, that hunt, in a way, mm -hmm. that sniff, or you, know, you, you read an article you know, in, whatever, the New York Times, and, and suddenly you, know, you hear something on, on NPR, and it, it, something clicks with, the, with what's brewing for mm -hmm. that issue, and it begins to resonate. So that is, that framing, and that filtering, and that um, absorption is part of editing for me. So I guess that's what I think of as, as editing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, you know, also down to the point of, obviously, the, the detail and mm -hmm. the technical editing. And it's recomposed, it's more sculpting. Mm -hmm. It's more editing and sculpting, mm -hmm. I think. I, I think a question I wanted to discuss may be obviated by some of the things that have already been said, but it has to do with, with uh, print versus not print. I, I mean, Praxis, I, it's so, well, well, Praxis and HDM both actually, AA Files too, I would include this. They're, they're, it's hard to imagine them without print. It's easier for me to imagine San Rocco on, online. It seems like maybe it would work well, and, and obviously Avery is, is an online magazine. But have, have those of you, HDM, Praxis, AA, ever considered an, an online only or primarily or, or venue, and did you guys consider in San Rocco an online venue? Uh, and, and, and I guess the opposite question for James. Maybe we could, could I start with San Rocco? Did you ever consider a more online? No, no. I mean, well, I say San Rocco started in 2010 very much as a printed magazine, which was maybe in 2010 a statement <laughs> in the sense that it was absolutely not evident to start a magazine in 2010, I guess. Uh, it's of course true that uh, over time uh, you sometimes think with the sold out issues from the beginning that is there a possibility that the early issues you could somehow get as a, as a print, but, but that's only secondary. For us it was important to have a printed book or magazine. Mm -hmm. as yeah, and, and let's say the, the reasons are mainly two, uh, one being that we are a bit fetishist about uh, objects, mm -hmm. uh, and then even books as an object, or book as an object. And uh, the second reason, maybe the more important, is that we still uh, have the tendency to believe that uh, if you print it, it is in a way more important, more stable. It is there. 
mm -hmm. might be a conservative view mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. let's say, our contemporary uh, universe, but that's what we think or what we are. <laughs> I mean, I know that a lot of people, like young students who would like to start a magazine, the budget for printing is just impossible. Some of you have institutional support, but, but actually you, Praxis doesn't. Wouldn't it have been easier online? No, so we, we did think, uh, yeah, uh, actually Mark Lampstar with PA Press, when we talked to them at the beginning, he was like, you should do this online, and then you know, five years later, he's like, that was the stupidest advice I ever gave anybody. Um, but I mean, well, first of all, when we started, there was an issue, again, that kind of, for us, we have a love of drawings, um, and we felt like they wouldn't uh, be able to uh, be seen or resolved well enough uh, in print at the time. Uh, I mean, uh, online in time, we felt like we needed the print. Um, but we did actually um, have, uh, I, if you fish around hard enough, I think you can still find it. Uh, with issue zero, we did an, uh, a site. We felt like it was important that it be a kind of parallel to the mm -hmm. journal and not reproduce any of the content. By the way, it actually now is JSTOR has it, so the older back mm -hmm. issues are they are online in a way. It's the right. PDF, so but I don't really think of that in the same way. Um, but the um, we did do a site, and it was again this is two thousand, so you know, but. The way we set it up was there was a, a means to kind of walk through a building and like, or walk through a drawing and hit a section line and get the image that yeah, yeah, went yeah. with that. Yeah. And it was really beautiful, but it was also one of these incredibly, my obsessive compulsive, you know, labor issues that, you know, the number of hours that went into each project to do that, it was just not sustainable, especially on to your question on budget, you mm -hmm. know, which we're we're supported by a national endowment. You know, we have just enough to print, right? And that's right. it. So, right. So I think actually, I mean, the budget question is sort of interesting for me because we are in an institution that's funded, but uh, evidently, but with the sort of budget that doing a kind of proper print release would have, I think would also come with certain institutional obligations that we wanted to be a little bit ambivalent toward. Like it's part of why we named it. Uh, for the library rather than name it for the school. We wanted to sort of strike just as much of a sort of inside outside as we could vis-a-vis -vis the school. So it is, I, I think, absolutely a sort of product of uh, some of the, the, the thinking that's happening at Columbia and we're all sort of constrained by our networks. But for me, the, uh, actually by keeping it, uh, the scrappiest thing that we do in mm -hmm. the Office of Publications, um, uh, it was actually really liberating in other ways. So I think for me, some of it is just you know, I'm a, a creature that reads on the internet and, and find a lack of sort of architecture there sometimes. But uh, some of it was really a sort of institutional positioning for us mm -hmm. also. Can you imagine taking more full advantage of online media as Ashley was saying? Or, or does, do you, but you're suggesting actually that already gets even more expensive than print in terms of labor costs. Yeah, just yeah. in terms of labor. For, I mean, again, at the time, and so because we wanted it to be, we just didn't want it to be another version of the journal. It had to be something else and give you a different experience. And then we just scrapped it. And mm -hmm. we were like, you know, maybe today it would be much easier to do something like that. I was amazed how, I don't know about San Rocco, I know all the other magazines the the student the student participation in things like graphics and 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 uh, sort of online work is is amazing, which is interesting. Thomas, are you ever does the AA push you on budget issues or they? It's, I mean, it, your, yours is the longest, the single longest uh, living living uh, uh, up here, so there's no danger of. Uh, being pushed online. Yeah, I mean, it's entirely married to the institution yeah. and financed through that institution. And it also, the dictates of that institution mean that uh, digital was never an option. I mean, not least because the digital was not invented in the 1850s when the AA was invented. Um, but it, in the, and the AA is not just a school, it's a club. So when you join the AA as a club, part of your money goes to me. Right. And, right. I, and I blow it. I right. blow every right. penny of it. Right. Um, um, 
It costs an absolute fortune, A files. But I'm also aware of the fact that its physicality is what people like, and people have them all, every single one. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's but it's a legally binding thing in the founding charter of the AA. It says that it will legally produce uh, a journal; otherwise, it's not an association. I see. Um, so it's a receipt. It's it's a, a legal document. So I physically have to uh, produce this tactile thing. It's really interesting. But it's also interesting how many how, how many up here are really object lovers, as you were saying, that, that, that the object, the quality of paper, the, the, the feeling, the texture, the cover, the quality of reproduction. It's, it's interesting that that is still such, uh, such an, a widespread issue. It seems to me it's, it's interesting. I, I want to get some response. I know there are some of you in the even in the audience who have thought about like trying to start a recurrent online uh, magazine or, or any other kinds of questions. Okay, <laughs> I was fishing, Natalia, yes. I'm a PhD student here and I just founded a journal with a group of students. A student journal, and uh, we are going through a lot of anxiety trying to define uh, what the project is uh, since the beginning, because it feels that once it's out there, um, everything you change, it will be interpreted as a mistake that you did uh, in the conception. And to me today, your projects were very clear, and I. So my question is, um, was that clear since the very beginning, or did you allow for some changes uh, as the journal continued? Uh, no, it was very clear. Everything was clear from the beginning. I'm, I'm sorry, it's uh, 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 but it's true. <laughs> uh, I don't want to discourage you. However, I think you should. <laughs> but I mean, I think I, I think that the mutable aspect is not a bad thing, and that we should embrace it. I like uh, when Jennifer uh, mentioned that she's not very regular in, in, like that she doesn't publish every. Uh, one year or every two years, like that. This yeah, yeah. thing changes. Yeah. So, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. I feel that sometimes we are trying to uh, be very politically correct or very formal. Like we have to define a theme. We have to have a name. We have to define if it is a magazine, a journal, or whatever. But in the end, uh, I see that some of you were even hesitant sometimes yeah. but, to call but, it. But can, can I ask? I'm sorry. Can mm -hmm. I ask you a question back? Yes. <laughs> Why would you want to make a magazine? I, I guess, f at least for us, at the time, that was the question, right? I mean, there's an urgency, I mean, for a, a project of a magazine. For us, that was very much there. I mean, we did not talk about it, but when we made the magazine, it, it appeared for the first time in 2010 in the uh, Venice Biennale, but it was, was in the making for two, three years because we, we, we were really upset in some way. We were upset about the fact that magazines, architecture magazines, were only publishing recent projects with the most pathetic text provided by architects, and it was about nothing. And, uh, and, and so we felt that there must have been another way to talk about architecture. So it was quite easy to define that other way for ourselves and then to, you know, to make that magazine. So I guess for you today, wanting or making a magazine even, the, the first question to ask is that, why do you want to make a magazine and what are you after? I, I think it's important yeah, you know, to, to I define mean, that. Uh, I, I have a project in mind. What I don't have in mind or what I don't want to impose is a form to that project. You know, that's, that's what I'm asking. But you have to impose a form uh, if you want to make a magazine. <laughs> or, okay, no, that's I mean, it's the the, a precondition, I would say. You know? okay. I'm, I, mean, we, we, I mean, just for what it's worth, we title, our first issue was issue zero, and that was really, that was not to be clever, that was because I was afraid that it was going to be a disaster, and we could just pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> We'd start with one, it was the kind of, t the pilot issue, so, um, but. No, but uh, I recognize that uh, our number one is also number zero, and it's called innocence, so we were very innocent about what we were after. <laughs> now, we, I don't know if we wanted it to die after zero, but it's certainly true that, <laughs> That you know, you. I mean, it's not because you know what you think you know today that that might not somehow redefine itself along the way. But I do agree with Andrea. It's it's very important that you, for now, <laughs> you know what you want. I think though that you can 
the, the whole nature of a magazine is that it can evolve and it can change and that sometimes um, if you declare too much in the beginning, you become paralyzed. And if you do just start and you do something and maybe it's not too grand and maybe it's not too big and maybe you don't spend too much money, but you take that first thing and the next issue might continue certain things that you've tried, but also discontinue others and grow in a certain way. And so I think that there are simply different approaches. I mean, sometimes you really know what you want and you have a vision and you get your money and you do it. And other times you're, you are really kind of feeling your way. And I think it's very um, healthy to just start and then to let the momentum build. And sometimes you just, you have to make something to know what you want to make. I'll say the opposite, just for the sake of saying the opposite, which is that I'm a big fan of backing yourself into corners. Uh, this was the sort of experience for the Avery Review. It's like, well, it's coming. We got another one. You know, so I, I think there is also something you said about uh, like uh, forcing yourself to have certain constraints that then allow you to, to, to relax about um, other things. Like, so you can go either way, I think. Anthony. I have a follow-up, it was, um, and it's gonna go towards to the discussion that started when you said that there was a lot of control or editorship that was going on that you saw. And what struck me was that he pointed out the journal that was probably around the longest. And it's been around for 160 something years and you're working on a project and everyone talked about the project as today. We all went back in history and talked about where essays started, where essays, where we began, we went back hundreds of years to talk to justify our position today, but really no one talked about where they were going. Um, the only one that kind of touched on that was the people that were willing to jump on their own knife and kill it too early and say, we're done, this is the end of the project. You can't, I guess you have a physical receipt you have to give out, but that itself has given you liberties to look into the future and say, I have security, I can test the medium, I can put an envelope in a journal and reconstitute what an essay becomes. But I was surprised that no one discussed the future. No one looked forward and said, this is where I want Praxis to be. This is where I want a journal to be. This is what I see a journal or a magazine or an essay could be. And um, why? I, I think that's an incredibly frustrating question to see that not come up. But should it be projective, a journal? Should you always look forward? Um, I don't think the medium has to be projective, but I think the object in itself as, as something that is being produced is um, valuable to understand where it could be or where it's been, I think. And the same way it, with that argument, we don't need to look back either. So I wonder if, if we're looking back and we, we allow that conversation to occur, the historical one, then the presence or the moment that it leaves our hands, the future, 100 years in the future, is it just, is it just an artifact? Is it something that sits on a coffee table that no one picked up the whole time we were presenting? Or does it become something more that we discuss beyond that format? I should say that uh, I didn't talk about it, but we are actually on our last issue too. We've decided to kill it <laughs> um, for uh, similar reasons. I mean, there was an urgent, we felt an urgency when we started it, uh, you know, in relation to this issue of the, the kind of uh, divide between the periodicals. And, it, and I think that it's not that that has been resolved, but I think the intellectual project that we put forth in that first issue has run its course and we've talked you know, at length about what to do, uh, and really just felt that we we wanted the the sixteen issues of the journal to have a kind of integrity, and the the best thing to do was just to allow them to instead of allowing it to evolve. I mean, it has evolved anyway. I mean, you know, we had this uh, a, a, an absolute mandate for ourselves that we would always have, you know. Uh, built or buildable projects, that was in the first. The last issue was on narrative, it was a series of stories. It was a, an issue called True Stories and it was all about architects using narrative as a generator for design. And so w once you start falling apart like that, I don't know how you felt, uh, you know, being the one person with the, the journal that's like, I felt like it was falling apart. And mm -hmm. it's like, you can't keep it together anymore and you don't want to, like, you don't want to force it into it's you know into a box, and so we're doing our last issue. But I think what what Kirsten said about how to begin is the same answer how to end. You you begin with a project. You begin for a, a reason, even an urgent reason, as you said. But when that project is finished, you really just want to close it. Yeah. 
But that's a different. That's different from a, a from obviously from from AA and even maybe. Yeah. I think there's even a big difference here in uh, let's say being truly professional about uh, having or running a magazine and being let's say hobbyists in <laughs> in the end because we are hobbyists. I mean, it's yeah, really yeah. our second or third or fourth. Occupation, job. I see. And it's yourself. It's my number one. It's my. It's 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 the only thing I do. Yeah, no, but yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's a big difference, right? Big difference. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, you took over the helm of AA Files at a certain point. I mean, it's a magazine with a long tradition, and and you do that beautifully. But that's that's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we. Somehow We're not paid to do it. No, not at all. <laughs> the, this, this half of the room, it's, it's no, volunteer no, no, work. It's not paid. Yeah. 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 No, but okay, that, that, that's, yeah, that's exactly because you feel, I mean, there's something which is missing and you try to fill that gap for yourself in the first place. So that's also why San Rocco as a project is highly egoistic. I mean, not just uh, for the two of us here, uh, certainly also for Pier Paolo, who is not here, and certainly also for the other three, four people who are very close uh, to San Rocco, and it's a editorial board, which is hardly an editorial board anyhow. But I mean, so it's a very, very personal project, and that's also why, I mean, we close the magazine, and it even, I mean, if I can give you at least a sense of future, I mean, it even evolved, and that was a, a difficult decision to not just kill it and say bye, but to say let's do something else, which we are doing, hmm? uh, because we feel at least for now that what we will do next we feel there's an urgency there, right? I mean, let's then see if we're right. So maybe we are in the same situation as you, right? That we think <laughs> that our next project makes sense, but maybe we figure out it makes no sense at all. Well, that's okay, huh? Yeah, feel better. Mm. Uh, Colin, I think this will be the last question. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to follow up on the questions about the anxieties of beginning with uh, the question about how you deal with the anxiety of things falling apart when you're in the middle of the project, but then the conversation already got there. So um, I, I just want to ask, um, after you, when you have a project that's falling apart or ending, how do you go about doing a post-mortem on it, let's say, and actually trying to think about why it fell apart? Or How do you end? <laughs> Can I tell you in a year? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm. We're still working on the. I've got to get the last issue out before I can. <laughs> Sorry, I was explaining the postmortem. I think before yeah. before I can. Postmortem. Maybe it's a very open ended I, question. I think it needs. I think it needs. It's a good question. It's it's one I look forward to to engaging. But I think I'm still too deep in in it at the moment to to. I mean, the amount of energy that it takes to put an issue out um, is. It's so full on for us. I mean, we don't have a big, it's like Amanda, me, and two to three other people at any one issue. Um, and none of us are paid. We're all doing this in the margins. And um, so, you know, I think it, it's so full on that I think the postmortem is going to be a great conversation to have in a year um, when I have that. But I think that there's kind of multiple deaths going on here, you know, that there's, it's not simply the journal. There's, I mean, in a way, we're all talking in our, our own little narcissistic way about yeah, yeah. a certain thing that we're trying to um, either in a kind of funereal way to celebrate mm -hmm. that demise or actually uh, re you know resist it whether it's a kind of writerly tradition a the tactility of the object um, even theme or untheme or I mean in my guys in a way I I'm slightly mourning an, a kind of aspect of the AA itself I mean I'm a, a kind of Sandinista insurrection against the AA, you know, as the AA's journal. And I think it allows you to do that so you can even mourn your own institution or what it's mm -hmm. become and then, you know, find other moments in its history that you find more relevant. That's where I think that that forward or backward question is inter particularly interesting to me, um, whether one can actually find a kind of liveliness in something that is gone. But I think this narcissism, is, that's interesting. I, I think we all feel that, but it's a narcissism born of commitment. Because 
it's really hard editing journals. It's not, even when you get paid, it's, it's hard. It's a lot of work for, for you, you know, and especially in our field where the, the readers, what, in assemblies it was 2,000, maybe HDM has, what, 10? No, not even. But see, it's very, very small in any case. Um, Ro San Rocco, I bet you don't have 2,000. Uh, 4,000, okay, so it's growing. But the seriality but, of it is also strangely deflating, I find, because it isn't a kind of sui generic, it isn't a sort of unique thing, because there's going to be another one. I'm always slightly down in the dumps when one comes out, rather than euphoric. I'm like, I've got to do mm -hmm. another one now. And it's that... You're over it by then. Yeah, so, <laughs> so in a way, death is sort of... I can see the appeal. <laughs> yeah. 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 So... Uh, I, I would actually, if we have time, just yeah, to can throw, you get them, me out of this so that, throw yeah. the question back. Well, I just don't feel like ending on this morbid note. And I, I mean, I am kind of curious when you ask about the future um, or looking ahead. Um, is there something you're envisioning or anyone else about where we should be going? Or could be going? I think it came from actually both your presentation and from Thomas's when you talked about the container. And you talked about the contents and the content, and there was this very playful linguistic game going on there. And then you're the most historical journal, let's say, is probably the least journal that was presented, right? We have objects, artifacts within the piece being preserved. And so I found interesting that the ones that are dying are the ones that probably met the limits of the container that they adopted. And the containers themselves are no longer fit for the tools that they're trying to force them into. So looking back at history, seeing the container as this journal and trying to fulfill its needs in today's rule is constantly producing failure and death. You know, we're, we're prematurely killing it because we haven't adopted today's own needs from it. So when we see something that has um, a journal showing when you pulled out the egg with the yolk, that's the kind of readership and authorship that I think is current, even though it's maybe the most vintage in perspective because it has a longer lineage, it does produce a more sensation of nowness because the container has had time to grow, change, morph, and change shape. It's no longer this um, image or semiotic viewing of what a journal that we constitute it to be. So I, the question was in the futuristic viewpoint if the container itself is what needs to be um, rethought. The fact that we're saying that we're still making journals but no one questions the container that you brought up, which was like I think a perfect um, way to view it, the, that, that constitutes the tactility, the boxes, we wait for it. I think that's the question was the surprise is gone when you just think of a journal. So it's all about form, not content. Um, I think they're both in the same for me. I think um, the content, specifically when you start looking at historical artifacts, I think we, those two very seamlessly join together in the way that we view them because of just general um, limits, I guess, on the form that controls what content can be produced and how it gets displayed, how you even said you control two spreads or one spread. So I just, I thought that was a very interesting point of view to seeing that the longest one is probably the one that's changed the shape or the container the most. That's not so strange, no? <laughs> it's, it's, that's not so strange, in a way, that's also how it survived. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that the longest one survived that way. <laughs> no, right. it's agility. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right, right. I mean, it, let's say San Rocco does not need to change its, its uh, form because that's exactly what it is about, you yeah. know? I mean, whereas I, I totally yeah. appreciate what AA Files does, and it's amazing that Tom can say at a certain point, take AA Files and turn it into, for a while at least, his magazine, let's mm -hmm. say, or his journal, sorry, <laughs> journal. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and then at a certain point, probably he, he walks out of it, I suppose, and then it becomes, uh, in a way, another journal. And I think that's very powerful of this. And maybe sadly so, I mean, the big Italian journals, I mean, European journals, which were more or less all Italian journals, are in this sad crisis where, where none of them is able somehow to, to keep uh, you know, current uh, with every new incarnation. And that the was, only exception being Arc Plus, probably. Well, yeah, Arc Plus, yeah. Arc Plus, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yes. I mean, Arc Plus is, I think, currently yeah. in Europe the, the only relevant magazine who manages and is probably better now than ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, to manage to be relevant, right? I mean, and make fantastic issues at this very moment. But, but all the Italian ones there. They're mm -hmm. close to that if they're not already, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. up. I mean, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but so but I have to understand, San Rocco started in that world, in that context. Uh, and, and for that reason, it was important there. But it's true, and I, I, I picked up the recent issue of Arc Plus. I see, well, I mean, at least part of the malaise, which we saw a few years ago, 
there has been found an answer to it. I mean, by by people who are absolutely brilliant uh, about what they do. And uh, I mean, I think you know, Tom Tom's a, a files is is perhaps the other answer. I mean, in Europe, mm -hmm. there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I want to end now. I, I think the students should feel should feel challenged. The it will your generation will be, if not the next one, soon soon. I mean, I'm trying to think of when these journals get started. How the age of most of the editors, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think the challenge, but also I really do think the, the, the possibilities of digital publication, but it, it, it still will come from people who love things. I mean, it won't be, it won't be sloppy, digital, easy, you know, unedited things. You think it's digital? No, I think the I next, I think now there will be, there should be a proliferation of highly specialized things, for example. I don't think any journal now in Europe or in the States, in any journal can claim like, like, in, like AA Files, like Arc Plus, like Oppositions did, claim to be the most important or, or one of the three most important journals. I think now there need to be 20 uh, why not? journals. Sorry? Why not, though? I, I, re I reject the idea the of specialization. Mm -hmm. I like the idea, in a sense, of creating something that has a kind of plurality to it. It's the same kind of reason mu to it. music can never. There's, there is the, music now is all niche, is all niche music, and there are hundreds of niches. I, I, I really would reject the idea of of niche and specialization, and in a sense, we have to identify our brand and our manifesto and our mm -hmm. kind of five points up front, and somehow you know, live up to that promise and then wither and die. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of creating a kind of common language and of a kind of quality control and that people rely on and that it actually maintains the culture of the discipline, the culture of architecture. Can we from two sides um, then make that the, the challenge? That That's the kind of yeah. thing that that has to now be worked out, I think. We, we need more BBC in some sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. This was really fun. Thank you all very much. <laughs>